Okay, so for someone that's watching this that might be a little confused about these ideas and is hearing or learning in college right now why intersectionality is good, right? And, and we mentioned the Oppression Olympics mm -hmm. before. Can you explain why this competing set of oppressions, or I don't even think they're real oppressions, I think they're uh, perceived oppressions, why this is actually something that can't hold? Well, it's the whole perspective uh, is that the, if you don't have a value that's what entitles you to consideration, that other people have to give money, time, sacrifice in some kind of way for you. But what it elevates is the, the person who um, can't be bothered to move. Um, so now we have to somehow pay that they can stay alive or, or can't be bothered to uh, educate themselves. So now we are in charge of their education. They won't look after their health, so we have to do it. They can't save for retirement, so we have to do it. And the it's, more they won't do those things, the, the more, more we have to give yes, them. Yes. That, that's the ultimate irony. So, and what you're taking then, everyone who achieves a value, and it's mm -hmm. way bit wider than money, if they've achieved knowledge, if they've achieved uh, any kind of success, if they've achieved happiness, they owe it to the people who haven't. You're destroying these people and you're leaving, the, everything is geared to these people. If you gear a system to the people who can't think, well, I mean, that is, won't think, won't work, won't struggle, what you're inviting is complete destruction. If that's your whole system's geared to that. Yeah. And this is what is the, the American Revolution is we're creating a system that's geared to the person who's not at all like that. Mm -hmm. We're geared to the ambitious person. It's not you have to have money or whatever, but you have to be willing to work and choose and, and think. And if you're doing that, here's a system in which you can thrive. And it, there's two really competing visions of who you're designing the system for. Right, and, and in a sense, intersectionality is inevitable. Once you accept a moral code, in which those who have ability or, or have education or have money owe morally, that's a moral duty to sacrifice for those who don't. Because then those who don't are now going to compete for these resources. And they can compete based on what standard, by how miserable they are. And the more miserable they can prove to the world they are, the more deserving they become. The more, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole moral code based on need. Whereas the founding of this country was a, it was a political system created to make possible the achievement of virtue, the achievement of success. It was, it was if you're not, if you're not going to work hard, if you're not going to strive, you know, you can go back to Europe in a sense. It was a, then yeah. implicit mm -hmm. assumption, mm -hmm. and indeed a lot of people did go back yeah. to Europe. A lot of the immigrants who came because they couldn't make it. But the idea is, this is a system geared towards the rational, the productive, the ambitious. The, the, the honest, the, the person who wants to take responsibility for their life and achieve something. And we've turned that completely upside down and now we're gearing the political system and this is why the welfare state is so destructive because it creates this mentality. This is why I think the New Deal was the beginning of this politically mm -hmm. because it creates this mentality of, oh, you're in need? Well, it's our duty now to help you. Mm -hmm. And now, but he's more in need. You know, how do, what do we do now? And, and of course the need expands and it ever grows and there's always more people in need. Uh, and, and you can get to a point where, where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said the other day, a society that creates billionaires or allows billionaires to, to come into existence is an immoral society. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's the exact opposite. A society that allows people free so that some people you know, because of their talents and skill and hard work and, and ability to create value, become billionaires. That's a great, exciting society. Right? She also thinks we have 12 years left on Earth thanks to uh, climate change. So we'll talk in 12 years. Yeah, 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 we'll, yeah we'll discuss yeah, that in yeah. 12 years. I, uh, I want to add just one point, because I think this distinction is really important. The issue is not that what about the few people who literally can't take care of themselves? Um, they might have some Alzheimer's or something like that. There are people like that. They're a relatively small number. Um, it's not, the, the issue is who cares, it's not who cares about these people. Yeah, people who are making something of their lives, you'll take care of a relative who has Alzheimer's. The but issue, what do you do for the, for the true outlier cases? I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but I think that would be one of the criticisms. People would say, well, you're just going, because the, there are, there are people that have mental health problems, there, whatever it is. Uh, um, what, what do you? What does a functioning society do about the, the, those really? I think the a functioning society 
at the sort of individual level, if it's your parents or whatever, you that's the, what you That's get. the ideal version, right? And then the wider version is you don't, these people, uh, it's unfortunate what's happened to them. There would be charity for these kinds of people. That's, this, is, this is why the distinction is so important. If you see for no fault of some, his own, he's in a really tough situation, either permanently like Alzheimer's, or just he, he's lost his job and he's having trouble. He's trying to find another job, having trouble. So you help him out for six months or something. There would be all kinds of organizations would do that. And you're looking at their, as, as human beings with real lives and and potential versus the people who don't want to take care of themselves mm -hmm. and choose not to. And this is the oppression Olympics is not all of a sudden we've got all these Alzheimer's people. Right. It's all of a sudden we've got all these people who, oh, okay, so if I say that I'm in need, that gives me a claim to everything. So I don't have to exert right. any effort. And it, it's the systems being geared to those yes. people. And what you saw in the 19th century um, into the 20th with the progressive, and this was deliberate, was that we're, you cannot talk about the deserving and undeserving poor. And that's how it used to be conceptualized. There's poor people, yeah, it's they they're, don't deserve their fate, and we're going to help them out. And there's poor people who drink their lives away and so on. And that, what they have to learn is that choice is wrong. And you don't learn that by bailing them out. And so, so there was the deserving poor, deserving of charity, and undeserving. And the progressive said, this is a moral abomination to make mm -hmm. that distinction. Mm -hmm. There's just the poor. And so now it's, it, you feel like, oh, so if you say you're not going to help the poor, you're not going to help this guy with Alzheimer's or med No, but you have to distinguish those two. And there, it, there's all kinds of um, push that you can't make that distinction. It, it's really hard, though, to deprogram people from believing that victimhood is virtue, yes. though, right? I mean, yes. people have been so uh, infected with this. Uh, just a, a quick anecdotal, anecdotal example is, when I was at University of New Hampshire, and there were the, all these kids are screaming at me, and one girl screamed something to the effect of, I could walk out of here and be shot. And I thought, this is actually crazy. <laughs> You're in New Hampshire. Yeah. You're at the University of New Hampshire. You keep telling me how oppressed you are. Yeah even though you're at a wonderful school in a very safe area and all that, but, but she needed this idea that it's possible she could walk outside and be shot. I don't know why she thought she might be shot, whether it was her skin color or, or whatever it was, but it was, I could see how pervasive it was. The need for something horrible could just come around the corner and nip me. But you see that in, in Alexandria Cortez with the 12 years, right? We, we, you know, so mm -hmm. when you take right, ideas it's the same out of it, it's the same concept, fear, is an amazing motivator when you're taking ideas out of the equation, when people are not thinking, you're trying to manipulate people's emotions, scare them. And, and you're seeing this on the right with immigration. It's, a, it's about elevating fear and then, you know, driving people to act based on that fear. So, so yes, people are fearful, irrationally fearful. They don't think about the facts. They don't think about, I'm in New Hampshire, who's gonna really shoot me here? Am I really oppressed? And then you also deny them the ability to take control of their own life because you deny them, you tell them they, they don't have free will. You tell mm -hmm. them they don't have control of their life. You tell them they are products of their, or their skin color or their genes or whatever it happens to be. So, I mean, if, if, I, had no, if I knew I had no free will, I'd be afraid. I, you know, I don't know what that even means, but <laughs> I, yeah, but I, right. I can't even contemplate right. not thinking I'd have free will. But, but I'd be afraid because how do I know what's going to happen next? I have no control over my life. That is a recipe for fear. And what you're seeing among these young people, and what, you, what is so sad about it, about these kids in New Hampshire, is how afraid they are. When I look at the environmentalists and you, you know, the world, and, and I see these young kids who really believe this, who, who are bought into this doom and gloom, I think, what a, what a waste, right? How sad is it that people are growing up in an environment where they think the actions that they're taking are, are, are going to destroy the planet, they're going to destroy their lives, and that they can't think themselves out of this. So it's challenging, but it goes back to what they need to be taught. They need to be yeah. taught they do have control over their life. They need to be taught that they can't think. They need to be taught the facts. That we need to elevate that discussion back to the area of ideas and free will and control and choices. And this, okay. I, this is why I think objectivism is so important for the, the sort of the, the era we're in or the cultural point. Um, because I think of it as it's the philosophy that the Enlightenment deserved but didn't get. Um, and that it's objectivism, Ayn Rand's theory is it's pro-reason, it's pro-science, 
It's pro-technology, it's pro-the individual, it's pro-capitalism. And it views the 19th century as this was the pinnacle of freeing man in the, in the broadest sense. And you see such tremendous, tremendous achievement in the 19th century. It's an end of war, of World War. You only get that back into the 20th century. Um, and I think the most unusual of all, it's pro the pursuit of happiness. So it, you were asking, like, how do you get people out of this that they view everything is about need and so on? You have to articulate a positive mm -hmm. vision and not only, it's important, not only about reason and science and technology, but a moral vision that what you should be striving for and what we sh when we look at people, what, how we should distinguish between good and evil is who is pursuing their own happiness and who is not. And to resurrect that moral idea and to give it a real underpinning in philosophy, that's what she was about. And she, I think she thought of herself as, I'm bringing a new moral perspective that has never really fully existed. And this is what we need. And so you need the positive. And she has a positive yeah, case. Yeah, there's to no make. way to undercut intersectionality. And I think this is part of the problem with a lot of the discussion going on today. While accepting the moral code that made intersectionality but, possible in the yeah. first mm -hmm. place. So it's, so it's hard. It, so, so I see a lot of intellectuals who, who are, who are well meaning, who, who see the evil in inter intersectionality, but can't really fight it because they're advocating for another form of altruism, another mm -hmm. form of the sacrifice of the individual to some other group. Unless you have a real new conception of morality, a, a, an alternative conception of morality, which Rand provides, of, of the individual pursuing their own values, pursuing their own life, pursuing their own happiness, that is the only alternative to, to the dead end that is, you know, tribalism and intersectionality. So I